Hi guys, welcome to our last lecture on chapter three. It's Friday, September 11th, nine o'clock. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. good, good, good. So um, we, last time we talked about peptides and we switch to proteins already. Let me start sharing the screen. Start sharing the screen. There we go. Yeah, we were talking, we were discussing things, what's this? We were talking about proteins and uh, specifically we were talking about the size, right? The molecular weight and the number of residues. And I asked you a question about uh, why the, um, the molecular weight is not always pr directly proportional to number of residues. Well, in general, it is close to being proportional. And uh, in general, if you have a molecular weight of the protein, you can approximately estimate how many amino acid residues are present in a protein. So what you need to do is you need, now because we have 20 amino acids, so you can use the number for the uh, average molecular weight, right? So let's do that. So let's try to estimate that. So the uh, average, so the um, molecular weight of protein of protein known, right? Known. Can we estimate the number of amino acids? Okay, so we have 20 amino acids, so, so we will use the average molecular weight of the 20 amino acids. So let's do that. So somebody has already done this for us. We don't need to calculate it ourselves. Average molecular weight of 20 amino acids. Is 138. So if we use this number, actually we're not gonna get a very good um, estimate. And there are two reasons. One is that lighter lighter amino acids predominate in proteins. So in other words, when you take the average of the 20 amino acids, that's not exactly the number we should use because light amino acids predominate. Predominate. So there'll be more glycines, for example, right? More glycines in proteins than tryptophans, right? So tryptophan, remember, has a large indole ring and uh, will be very heavy. Glycine is the lightest of all amino acids, uh, but there are more glycines than tryptophans. And so uh, that changes this number. If we take into account the distribution of these 20 amino acids in proteins, this will change the number to 128. So decrease by 10. 
So then the question for you is, so is this the number we should use? So if you have molecular weight of the protein, I divide by 128, will I get a good estimate of the number of amino acids? What else is missing here? So it's not 28, it's, there's some, it's a different number. But why would it be different? What am I, what am I not saying? Because they have different R groups. Well, different R groups, but uh, you know, it doesn't matter what R groups are, we have the number, right? We have the, R, we have the number that takes into account the average molecular weight of all amino acids and their distribution in proteins. So it's a good number, right? It takes into account a lot of things. Is it what, a constant? You need a constant what, what, that. what does not take it into account? There's something else. Is it the hydrolysis reaction, the loss of the water? Loss of water, exactly. So uh, when we couple, now let's go to um, our slide here. What happens? Do we simply, remember this was a slide for test one, right? Remember I asked you about uh, why amides are hydrolyzed more with more difficulty than esters? I hope you have been thinking about it. So, um, so proteins are not just mixtures of amino acids. Proteins are composed, or proteins are formed by the removal of water, right? So for each amino acid in a protein, you will lose one, one molecule of water. Okay, so this number does not account for the loss of water. loss of water when the amino acids are coupled upon amino acid coupling. What's the molecular weight of water? Eighteen point oh two. Eighteen. So we do one twenty eight minus eighteen, and that's going to be the average number per amino acid in proteins that we should use. One ten. So if you have a question on the test that says, gives you the molecular weight of a protein and ask you to estimate number of amino acids, this is the number you should be using, 110. And this is the de derivation of this number. Some so we divide by 110? Yeah, so you divide the molecular weight by 110 and it will give you the most accurate prediction as far as the number of amino acids. Okay. Make sense? All right. So we uh, talked about various modifications of proteins, but also proteins can be conjugated to um, other macromolecules, larger molecules, right? For example, uh, proteins can be conjugated with lipids and we will actually learn about that. So those are known as lipoproteins. They can be conjugated to carbohydrates. So those are known as glycoproteins. In fact, most proteins on the cell surface, right? Any kind of cell, which um, is lined by various proteins. Basically you have cell membrane. So we'll talk about the cell membrane, which is composed of the uh, lipids, right? And so there are proteins which protrude, which uh, go through the cell membrane and stick out their noses on the other side, on the outside of the cell, of the cell membrane, on the, on the external surface. So, uh, so most of these are glycosylated, right? So these proteins form, complex, form uh, covalent bonds with, with carbohydrates. You will see lots of glucose, galactose, and depending on the cell type, there are different carbohydrates predominate. We will um, 
later on later on learn about a carbohydrate known as sialic acid sialic acid and in the context of for example uh, treating cancer so we um so this is kind of ongoing discussion in our class how to target cancer cells in the presence of normal cells because that's the major problem with chemotherapy uh, if you so there are a lot of approaches now where a drug is conjugated to an antibody which targets sialic acid because cancer cells overexpress sialic acid okay so cancer cells cancer cells when i say overexpress that means that they produce them in larger quantities than than other cells over express or express sialic acid and if you attach your drug to an antibody that recognizes sialic acid then the drug will be delivered specifically to these cancer cells and that's an ongoing area of research um, unfortunately antibodies are not easy to deal with it's not easy to attach a drug to an antibody so there are a lot of um, technical issues but the approach is there and, um, and and people are working very hard on it and so so these are glycoproteins now phosphoproteins we talked about that right so you can phosphorylate uh, tyrosine serine threonine various OH containing amino acids on the proteins so we'll talk about heme, heme uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about hemoglobin in chapter five, right? When we talk about oxygen tr um, transport in the body. So uh, we will find that heme, which is a prosthetic group, will be attached to um, a protein to form hemoglobin. Now flavin, so these are uh, various um, redox, molecules that participate in oxidation reduction metalloproteins and so on and so forth so um, proteins can be conjugated with uh, these large prosthetic groups so keep that in mind <clears throat> all right so in general so for, from now on we're going to be learning a lot of things about proteins now we know the the alpha we know we know the language right so now we know how what the proteins are composed of and we know the amino acids right we know the basic properties of those proteins which are based on those amino acids and so these are the questions we're going to be answering from now on so when you have when you deal with it with the protein for the first time the first question you ask what is the sequence and composition right so what kind of amino acids are proteins a specific protein composed of okay which of these twin amino acids are present and in, in, and how many but then the next level will be okay this chain of amino acids how does it fold so in other words what is this three-dimensional structure Okay, so proteins, all proteins are folded except for some, which is also, we're gonna talk a little bit about some um, intrinsically uh, misfolded proteins or unfolded proteins, which do not have a particular three-dimensional structure. So, um, but in general, uh, most proteins to perform their function, they have a specific three-dimensional structure. So uh, the, then the question is, how does it find in native, its native fold, right? So on the ribosomes, if you uh, remember from, bio, from um, basic biology, right? So the proteins are produced like a, like a conveyor chain, right? One, one amino acid was, will be attached to the next one, next one, next one, next one. And that will be like a, um, like a string, string of the protein coming off the ribosome. 
right? But then the question is, how does it actually fold? How does it find its native fold? Yeah, why why doesn't it misfold? Why doesn't it fold? Why doesn't it form a incorrect three dimensional structure? How does it find its correct three dimensional structure? So it's very important, and there are a variety of methods that proteins utilize to find these native folds. Because if the protein is mis misfolded, if it's not folded correctly, it will not perform the function that it should be performing. Uh, how does it achieve its biochemical role? So, uh, for example, if it's an enzyme, right? So, um, which amino acids are present at the active site and how they participate in carrying out a particular reaction? And then how is this reaction regulated? How is it expedited? How is it slowed down? Right, so what other parts of the protein are involved? For example, if you have a, what's known as a product inhibition, right? So in other words, if your enzyme produces lots of product and the product accumulates and the product itself will come back and bind to a different site on the protein and slow down the reaction, right? Which makes sense. If there's too, there too much product, then the product can actually participate in the regulation. Right, too much product produced, so the enzyme will be slowed down to start producing less of this product. And so the product itself can bind to a non-catalytic site on a protein, slowing it down. How does it interact with other macromolecules? This is very important. So, uh, so proteins do not just swim in, in cytoplasm or mitochondria or in different fluids or membranes by themselves, right? So they interact with other macromolecules. And a very important type of interaction is known as protein-protein protein-protein interaction. All that means is that the two proteins associate and one passes on some kind of signal. So we talked this a little bit about when we talked about phosphorylation cascade, right? So one protein is phosphorylated on a tyrosine residue and another protein comes in and binds to it and gets activated in some way. So uh, in this case, let's say, imagine you have a one protein, it's coming into contact with another protein, like so, right? And the function is passed on from one protein to the next one. And so in many cases, these form uh, signaling pathways, right? We talked about this a little bit. And so for example, if this is overexpressed, in or mutated in some way and is not regulated well like in a cancer in a cancer cell so the signal will be passed on from one protein to the next go to the nucleus and make the nucle nucleus um, start replicating the dna and initiate cell division so how do you inhibit this kind of process so this is a very hot area in drug design and so uh, the problem is you can see, so if you have a inhibitor, small molecule like this, inhibitor. So all our drugs or most of our drugs are small molecules, right? These are the most successful types of drugs. Inhibitor. So this inhibitor will go in there and sit in here. And do you think this inhibitor will actually be effective in breaking the protein-protein interaction? Just think about it. So you have one palm, so the two proteins, my left, my left palm and my, my right palm. So I put, I put glue on both of them, right? And then I um, glue them together. And that's my protein-protein interaction. Very hard to break it. Now, let's say I use a small molecule drug inhibitor let's say a penny, right? I put a penny on one of the palms and I still bring the two palms together 
will the penny stop the two palms from being glued to each other? No, very, very little, right? And so you can see that there's a ma major challenge in drug design uh, to discover small molecules that can break up these protein-protein interactions because proteins interact with each other using large surfaces. Large surfaces and uh, very hard to break those. Uh, very interesting area in drug discovery. So if those of you who want to pursue a career in medical sciences or health related sciences, so this is the um, challenge of the future, right? How to break up the protein-protein interactions with small molecule drugs. All right, where it is localized within the cell, yeah, obviously um, some proteins live in the cytoplasm, some proteins live in the membrane, in mitochondria, in the plasmic reticulum, right? So um, depending on where it is, it perf a protein performs different function and physical chemical properties. So, so this is important for, the, for um, our discussion that follows. So this will be used for um, to separate proteins, to purify protein of, the protein of interest. All right. So if you want to study a protein, obviously you want to get a pure protein, right? So, um, so luckily not all proteins are the same and they have different amino acid sequences. And the sequences of amino these amino acids and their arrangements will give a polypeptide a different chemical character, right? Some of them will be charged, non-charged, polar, less polar, more hydrophobic, less hydrophobic. Uh, another very, very useful technique to separate a particular protein is um, the fact that proteins bind some specific targets. It's just like going fishing, right? Fish them out. Just think about it. So let's say you, um, you, have, uh, you go fishing, you have some bait. You throw the bait, put the bait on the hook, throw it in the water, and the fish bites and you pull the fish out, right? So the same idea. So here you will use a specific small molecule target, right? Which you will attach to some kind of solid support so that you can ice, uh, get the protein out of the mixture. So the protein of interest will bind to your bait, right? Will bind to your small molecule specific target. And other proteins will not. And then you just fish it out, fish it out and release it from the, from the hook, just like you would release fish from, a, from the hook. So very, um, very promising approach. The major challenge here is actually to attach this specific target to specific support that you can pull the protein out. Okay. So a uh, majority of proteins, uh, how they produce in quantity? They produced in various microbiological systems, for example, E. coli, a bacteria, which is a um, great uh, way to produce many proteins. Basically you put a gene of interest into an E. coli and E. coli will express it and you can produce it and purify a particular protein from a mixture. So what you will do as the first thing is, um, you will break up the cell membrane, right? And you will obtain what's known as a crude extract. Crude extract. So this will contain thousands of proteins. And among those will be a protein of interest to you. Will be a protein of interest to you. So if you, uh, the first thing you can do before you do any thorough purification, you can employ a technique, an old classical technique, which is known as salting out. Salting out. 
from general chemistry, you may have heard, you should have heard a term, ionic strength, ionic strength. So various species are soluble in water dependent on the ionic strength of that water. And you can change that with by, dis, by putting salts in the water, right? By putting salts, you're putting ions in the water. You're making water more polar. You're making, if the water, if you think the water is polar, right? You can make it even more polar with different salts. So if your protein, for example, is sufficiently, if it's not so well water soluble, but still dissolves, but it's, but it has a lot of hydrophobic groups, you know, it doesn't really go, like to go in the water. You can salt it out very easily by adding some salt. And one of the um, most commonly used salts is ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate. You put ammonium sulfate. First, you put a small amount of ammonium sulfate and you get some proteins to precipitate. So proteins which did not like to be in the water to begin with, but somehow did manage to go in the water. If you add a little bit of ammonium sulfate, they will come out first. And then you just simply filter centrifuge and you, you take it out. Then you add more water sorry, more salt, you increase uh, more polarity, polarity more, and uh, you get, get uh, more polar proteins out and so on and so forth. So salting out can actually, by increasing the amount of salt, you can actually uh, precipitate proteins based on their solubility in these uh, salt containing solutions. So that's the first thing you can do. Uh, the second thing, now salting out, let's call this one. The second thing you can do before you do any further thorough purif purification is you can do dialysis. Does anybody with dialysis, is, anybody knows what dialysis is? Um, kind of like chroma. Oh my gosh, chromatically, I can't say it, sleepy, I'm sorry. Uh, pretty much where um, you're running them through a, a stationary state in the mobile phase and you kind of run them through, something like that, or is that? Well, that will be column chromatography and we're gonna talk about that on the next slide, yes. Dialysis is slightly different. Dialysis is used to separate proteins from small molecules. separate from small molecules. Oops, that's a big. Eraser. from small molecules. So basically, um, just write down what I say. I'm not gonna write it down. So basically you put the protein or mixture of proteins in a, um, in a bag, uh, literally a bag with the semi-permeable semi -permeable membrane. So the semi-permeable, so, so the pores in the membrane will allow for the small molecules to go in and out, but the proteins will stay inside because they're too large. They will not be able to pass through the pores. And so uh, you put this uh, bag with the protein or proteins into a buffer, right? And allow for all the small molecules that were associated with your protein to pass through. 
And because of the concentration gradient, right? So the, on the outside of the bag, the concentration of this small molecule is small. And so, so the small molecule basically will come out of the bag and take up the space outside of the bag. And you can do this dialysis multiple times because you know it's not that all small molecules will come out. Some of it will still stay inside because you will have an equilibrium established, right? So, so the concentration on the outside will be equal to the concentration on the inside. So dialysis will only allow you to, uh, to get rid of this small molecule to the extent of this equilibrium. But then you can take out this buffer solution and replace it by fresh buffer that again has no small molecule in it and you can uh, pull more of the small molecule out of the bag, right? So by several rounds of such uh, replacements of, of the buffer, you can get rid of virtually of any small molecule. And actually this is one way uh, after salting out, you may ask, okay, I salted this out, but I still have this ammonium sulfate uh, stuck with my protein. That's how you get rid of this salt, for example, right through dialysis. Okay, so these are some uh, uh, preliminary ways to purify the uh, proteins, but the most uh, effective ones. So let's go over those. So we have column chromatography. So that's what we were just discussing briefly, right? So we will have a column, we have a column, we have a stationary phase, uh, some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, beads, polymeric beads, or some kind of porous matrix that proteins will interact with, right? Can, can actually have some kind of attraction. And you put a band of proteins at the top of the column and you push the solvent through, right? So this is, this is time zero. So we haven't really run the solvent through yet. And at the bottom here, there's a porous support which will allow for this solution to go through, but will keep the stationary phase inside, right? And so after a certain period of time, you can see the protein mixture is starting to separate into bands. And luckily in this case, bands are colored, not always, doesn't always happen, but uh, when it happens, it's, uh, it's great because you can see the protein bands very easily. And as, it, as time progresses, then more separation, more separation, until fractions are starting to come in off the column, right? Fraction C comes off first, then B, then A. <coughs> and, and basically you separate them into these um, test tubes. And there's some kind of detector. If you can uh, see them by color, that's great. If you don't see them by color, for example, you can use UV light. So we talked about the fact that proteins absorb UV radiation due to Remember which amino acids are responsible for the ultraviolet light absorption by proteins? Which, which amino acids are responsible for that? So not all amino acids, all amino acid side chains will absorb light, UV light, but two or three of them will. Let's see, have you started doing homework yet? Is it the aromatic ones? The aromatic ones. Remember which ones they are? Um, is it tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, phenylalanine not so much. Uh, it's a, it's an aromatic one, but it doesn't absorb. Uh, doesn't have a very high extinction coefficient. But uh, tyrosine and especially tryptophan, they have very high extinction coefficient, so they absorb UV light very strongly. Around two two eighty nanometers. Does chrom All right. chromatography still, in this scenario, separate it based off of uh, polarity? Right, so this totally depends on your solid phase, right? So it depends on the solid phase. So the separation, the way this is separation works is that um, your stationary phase, so, you, so your proteins basically equilibrate from, uh, they go into the solution and they go and absorb, absorb themselves to the surface of the uh, solid support. They come on, come off, come on, come off, right? And so the higher the affinity they have for the solid support, the more time they spend being attached to the solid support. And so their migration will be slower. 
right? So it depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the stationary phase. And you can uh, choose the stationary phase depending on what kind of proteins you separate. So. All right, separation by charge. Uh, ion exchange. So we talked about the fact that uh, many amino acids will be charged and they will um, make proteins charged because of that, right? And so here we have a resin, some kind of polymer, which will contain charges on it, right? So these are beads, polymer beads. And that's the stationary phase in gray that uh, is formed by uh, these resin beads. And so the proteins are these blue ones, blue spheres, which have charges on them. And you can see what happens here. So if the resin is negative, if the resin is negatively charged, then the proteins which carry the um, predominantly positive charges, they will be, mi they will be mi migrating slowly, right? Because they will be electrostatically attracted to the stationary phase and they will move very slowly. And you can see here, so the blue large net positive charge. Now proteins, you can see finally red ones have a large negative charge and they will be repelled, repelled by the polymer beads and they will actually go through very quickly and come out in earlier fractions. And so you can separate proteins based on their net um, charge, right? So, so here is something that um, you may find on the test as well, kind of a test type question, test question. So if I have a, if I have, um, let's say a peptide, not a protein, but a peptide, that has uh, two aspartates and one lysine in terms of charged amino acids and a peptide that has two lysines and two and one aspartate. So let me write this down so I don't get, don't, don't get you confused. So, so two aspartates one lysine and let's say 10 glycines versus protein that has one aspartate three arginines and then alanines, which will be eluded first on this column. Just to clarify that top one is two aspartate, one lysine and 10 glycine. Yeah. Okay. Which one will be looted first? Would it be the top one? So can you explain? Because it's nonpolar. It's nonpolar? Or, I mean, it's polar. What's the net negative charge on that, on that peptide? Is it positive two? You sure? Not really. Should study your amino acids, guys. Sorry again. Uh, for the second one, is that glycine at the end or was that lysine, the 10, at the, for the second one? The second one, 10 alanines. Here? Yeah. 
than alanines. So this is neutral, so don't worry about that. What you have to look at, you have to look at the charged amino acids and derive the net charge. Okay, I'll help you. What's the, what is the charge on the aspartate? Negative. Negative, so there are two of them. Charge on the lysine. Positive. Positive. So, so this peptide will have a net, one net negative charge, correct? How about the bottom one? Now, this is negatively charged aspartate. What about arginine? Isn't it positive? Positive. So three positives, one negative, so two positive charges, correct? And so if we look at the resin, so the resin will predominantly interact with the positive charge and it will repel the negative charge. So the, if it repels a negative charge, the negative charge will go through more quickly than a positive charge, correct? So the first one will be the, um, if we say this is A, this is B, the first is A. Okay, so, so you should be able to um, predict the, um, how the various peptides will interact with the with the ion exchange um, column. Which ones will be looted first? Which ones will be looted last? All right, size exclusion. Size exclusion. So here uh, we have a uh, porous polymeric stationary phase, which will allow for the small small proteins to come into the inside the inside the beads right, because they have small pores, but the large proteins will not be able to come in and will basically simply go around those beads and will be looted first. So here in the size exclusion uh, chromatography, large molecules will come out first and small molecules, because they get stuck in these pores, will come out last. So this is known as a size exclusion, right, so based surely, um, purely based on size. Now, binding affinity, we talked about that, right? So we're not gonna spend much time on the slide, but in general, you can see what, what happens here. We have a ligand uh, attached to the, some kind of solid support. And so the, the protein of interest that has affinity for this ligand will interact with it, right? And it will stick to the column and stay. And the proteins which do not interact will go straight through they have no affinity for the ligand and they'll come off first. And then the question is, how do you get, how do you get these guys off the column after that? And it's very easy. All you do is just, you take a soluble ligand, soluble ligand and pass that through. And so this soluble ligand will start competing with the ligand on a stationary phase, right? And it will occupy the binding sites and allow for the protein to come, to basically to, to come off the column and be eluded, right? So, um, so the last step will be the application of the soluble ligand. So uh, spend some time on the slide and read, uh, read the text and uh, things should be pretty straightforward. All right, electrophoresis, electrophoresis. So here we have, um, uh, we're gonna put the proteins in the electric field. Okay, and since proteins are charged, right, they will be pulled towards one of the electrodes and we'll have the uh, gel matrix, which will slow them down, right? So the proteins will not just simply be pulled very quickly towards the electrode, they will actually be slowed down by the gel. And the gel will be polyacrylamid, right? So this is cross-linked polymer. And uh, let's see how this works. So this is the electrophoresis apparatus, you can see here. So uh, it's filled with the polyacrylamide gel 
we're going to put the sample in these wells at the top and we're going to apply the electric field okay so in this case this electrode we're going to apply the positive charge and so the proteins which are negatively charged they will migrate towards this towards this end and uh, what you may wonder, um, so the migration depends on the size of the proteins, right? Migration, is, migration depends on the size of the proteins, but it also depends on the shape, right? So even though one protein may be smaller than another protein, but it's more branched, right? Let's say it has, it's like, you know, going into the into a jungle with your arms spread out even though you may be a small person, but you may have hard time getting through the, all these branches. But a big person will uh, you know, put his arms like that, turn into a uh, potato, and will be able to get through the branches very easily, even though the person is much bigger. And so what happens is uh, in gel electrophoresis, uh, there is a special reagent, SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, it's known as a detergent. So this nonpolar end will go inside the protein and will unfold it. It will unfold it. So the protein will be fully in its fully stretched face, stretch, stretch, stretch shape, right? And so, and so all the proteins, so the small proteins can be compared now to large proteins because they have the same shape. They have the same shape, they're all linear, they're not branched. And so the proteins will be separated um, purely based on their size. And another advantage of using this SDS is that um, it will uniformly give all proteins a negative charge. And you can see here, we, the proteins will migrate towards the positively charged electrode, right? So SDS will make sure that uh, the proteins will migrate towards the positively charged and and so this kind of electrophoresis is known as SDS page right sodium the decyl sulfate polyacrylamide, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis SDS page so very now it's a very common technique uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that this is done primarily on an analytical scale not for separation, right? But primarily to visualize protein mixtures and um, to find out if a particular protein is present in your extract. So for example, here. So here are, so this is the, um, a, a picture of a gel that was uh, obtained by gel electrophoresis, right? Again, keep in mind that the smaller proteins will be at the bottom larger proteins will not migrate much they will be at the top and so here we have molecular weight markers so here we we, we apply a mixture of known proteins with known molecular weights and so we know exactly the position of these proteins on this gel right we know that if there's a protein in this area somewhere the molecular weight will be around twenty-one thousand, right if it's here it will be 66,000. So, and you know that you can induce the expression of a particular protein in a cell, right? So uh, not all proteins are produced by every cell all the time, depending on what cell is doing, depending on what signal it receives from the extracellular environment. The cell will produce these different proteins. And you can see here, the protein of interest for us is this one here at 45,000. And if the cell is not induced, let's say there's no, let's say it's one protein responsible for cell division and there's no growth factor. There's no growth factor, cell is uninduced. So this growth factor is not expressed, not expressed. And so it's absent here. But then we induce this cell and we can see quite a bit of this protein has been obtained. Now, if we break up the cell, break up the cell membrane and release, release all the proteins, then we can see there is a lot of this protein um, produced. Now that we're doing, we're doing salting out with the ammonium, sulf, ammonium uh, sulfate, ammonium sulfate, 
And here we have a quite reasonably pure already protein of interest, right? There's some junk here, but it's primarily pure. Then we apply it to anion exchange and cation exchange columns. Uh, and we get quite reasonably pure proteins. And finally, a pure protein after all these purification steps. Again, this is analytical scale and we get a protein which weighs 45,000 and it's gonna be fully purified. And of course, if you don't know the weight of the protein, very, uh, since you're using the protein markers, very easy to estimate it. You can see here, basically you do a rel relative migration graph versus the log of molecular weight. Put all the proteins here. Find the prote protein of interest based on its migration, right? Migration is right here. You put it on this, on this graph and then you can very accurately calculate the molecular weight. And just a couple more minutes, guys. There is uh, one other technique I want to briefly discuss, very useful, uh, used for purification of proteins from very large quantity of other proteins, thousands of other proteins, known as um, combination of isoelectric focusing and electrophoresis. So what's isoelectric focusing? So here we have a gel strip, right? Which will have a mobilized pH gradient. So what does this mean? This, is, this means that there'll be acids and bases, okay? Acids and bases, let's say there are acids, acids and bases, basically small molecules. which will, uh, we will apply electric field and those acids and bases will um, find a position for themselves in this electric field, right? Uh, where the, uh, and create local pH. So there will be, um, so these acids and bases known as amphalites, they will create local pH regions. And so let's say we start with the pH nine here in this area and go to pH three in this area, right? And then we uh, allow for a um, mixture of proteins to uh, apply to this strip, apply the electric field, right? And the proteins will start migrating towards this, in, to, along this strip until they reach a pH region where they become isoelectric. Remember this equivalence point? Remember what it means? It means that the protein has no charge. If the protein has no charge, it stops migrating. Stops migrating and uh, total charge is zero and it basically localizes in this particular area. So this is known as isoelectric focusing, right? Basically each protein localizes by um, finding the pH value where it becomes electrically new, uh, neutral. So uh, after that, what you do, after you've applied the isoelectric focusing, then you put this strip on top of the gel electrophoresis um, plate, right? And allow for these proteins to migrate towards the positively charged electrode. And so you have a two dimensional, so 2D stands for two dimensional separation. So horizontally, horizontally, these proteins will be separated based on their PI equivalence points, right? So in other words, the points at which they become neutral and along the vertical direction, they will be separated based on their molecular weight. And so you have all these 1000 proteins in this square but it's not just you know one linear separation. It's uh, basically a separation in two dimensions. So much more precise. So this is known as a 2D, 2D separation. Okay, so I think, uh, so there are a couple other topics that we didn't get to. So what I will do is uh, um, I will assign home reading. It will be about 10 pages.
that we still need to cover with kind of run out of time, but they're they're pretty easy. You can read about them. Um, if you have any questions about uh, this material that, that I assigned for reading, uh, please um, throw your questions into the discussion on Canvas. Okay, discussion on Canvas and uh, I'll help you with any uh, questions you may have. And do you have any questions at this point for me about this lecture, about uh, this chapter, amino acids, peptides, proteins? So, uh, so these were primary structures, primary structures, of amino primary linear sequences of amino acids. And uh, the next chapter will deal with the three-dimensional arrangement of these. So. I have a question. Yeah. Is there a list of the solvents that are used to figure out um, what is it, um, the way that an amino acid is put together? There's some questions on the homework that I was struggling with to figure out the order of the amino acids on a protein. Is there some sort of like list of all the solvents that are used to cut up the amino acids in chemical processing? Mm. Um, solvents to figure out the, you, you sequence in a particular protein? Yeah. Using Edmond degradation? Yeah, that was the term for it, I couldn't remember. Um. But the procedure is pretty straightforward. I think it's the, uh, I've never done it, but uh, as far as the solvent, we usually, uh, you would use a, a buffer because the protein has, when you work with proteins, you work with buffers. Okay. So, uh, but what was this question exactly? Maybe, uh, maybe what you can do is uh, put that question on, uh, into the discussion on Canvas and we can, uh, we can look into it in more de in more detail. Okay, I will. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys, have a good uh, weekend, and don't forget the homework is due on Monday, so it will be a working weekend for you. And um, I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye.